start in a few minutes because we heard that the plenary's just finished now, so we're just going to give people a few minutes to join us, so we'll start in about five minutes. Thank you.
I think we can start. Excellencies, distinguished representatives, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you. I am Maurizio Navarra, coordinator of the Donor Platform Secretariat, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Tristan Armstrong, the co-chair of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, senior sector specialist at the Agricultural Development of Food Security Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australia. Now, Tristan is on his way from Australia. That's a quite, a, quite a long flight. And unfortunately, his flight was delayed. So I'm speaking on his behalf today. So our sincere thanks for participating in today's CFS side event on innovative approaches to sustainable food systems transformation. We are glad to see so many of you already here, both in person and online. On behalf of the Global Donor Platform, let me thank our co-organizer of this event, the Shamba Center for Food and Climate, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, South Africa's Western Cape Government, Department of Agriculture, and the World Food Programme, office, Regional Office of Nairobi. This event is occurring at a crucial point in time. The global community is facing escalating acute and chronic food insecurities, with even tighter cycles of crisis due to climate change, the conflict in Ukraine and in the Middle East, and the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Why are we holding this side event? Why do we feel it is, is it, it is important at this point in history to organize a conversation on innovative financing for food systems? There is a chronic lack of financing for the agricultural sector. We all know that. For example, in East Africa alone, 65% of the population is employed in agriculture, accounting on average for 25% of the national GDPs. However, the agricultural sector receives only 5% in commercial bank lending. And this pattern is consistent across all countries in the world. For instance, keep it the example of East Africa. In Kenya, agriculture receives only 4% in commercial bank lending, despite accounting 34% to the national GDP in agriculture. In Tanzania, this figure grows up to 7%, while in Rwanda, only 2% is received in commercial bank loans. Now, small and medium agricultural enterprises, SMEs, account for millions of farmers across the globe and produce the majority of the world's food. However, financial institutions often consider agri-food SMEs too risky and costly to serve, primarily when they work within informal value chains, which is often the case. Many define this as the missing middle, that is, the missing middle for agri-SME finance. While some lending activity exists, the unattractive economics of serving this segment indicate why there is lack of successful business model for saving it at scale. Now, in parallel with the lack of commercial finance for agri-food SMEs, public donors and, government and governments face budget constraints and limited fiscal capacity, reducing their ability to alleviate food insecurity. Now, development finance alone, ODA, cannot fill the additional 33 to 50 billion dollars per year that the investment gap that is needed for SDG2. More is needed to make other sources of development finance work. Now, the side event today will look at, among other things, how donors and governments can collaborate with the private sector to achieve SDG, SDG2. With this, I'm pleased to pass the floor to Karen Smoller, Executive Director for the Shamba Center for Food and Climate, who is our moderator for today's session. Again, thank you all for your attendance and participation. And over to you, Karen. Thank you, Maurizio. And in order for us to get stuck straight into this, I would like to invite all of our panelists to now join me up on the, the stage. Um, so we can look at the experiences that many of you have had in trying to find more innovative ways to finance that investment gap um, in food systems. As Maurizio said while you're joining me, and please also come close to me, um, as Maurizio said, the investment gap for food systems 
is growing, while at the same time, the budgets of governments and donors seems to be shrinking and facing ever higher debt levels. So the goal of this side event is really to explore how we can better use those scarce government and donor resources to mobilize other sources of finance, particularly from development banks and from the private sector. Um, we have three parts to this um, side event. In the first part, we are going to start with a new report by the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development and the Shamba Centre for Food and Climate, which has just conducted an inquiry into how donors are actually making their food funding more catalytic. We're then going to turn to the case of South Africa and to see what the South African government, particularly the Western Cape Department of Agriculture, is doing. Um, before we turn to the, the case of the um, FCDO uh, project, the Commercial Agriculture for Smallholders and Agribusinesses project in Nepal. We'll look at those two examples. And then we will end with a session on what the cost of the inaction is. And we will turn to the experience of the World Food Program to look at the, the cost of not acting. So, I would like to start with my colleague, Oshani Pereira, who is the co-founder and director of programs of the Shamba Center for Food and Climate, to share with us some of the key findings from this inquiry on innovative ways to finance food systems. Oshani, you have the floor. Microphone. Thank you, Karen. The inquiry spanned over 60 to 70 stakeholders, different walks of life, exploring how donors can make their funding more catalytic. And the key message that we are proud to share is this. For every dollar of overseas development assistance, food and agriculture has the potential to bring in, on average, four additional dollars of money from the development finance institutions and from private investors. So this is significant. This increases the pool of money to spend on sustainable agriculture, on sustainable food systems by a large sum. And this money, this extra $4 is very important because we need to channel more capital, more financing to small and medium-sized enterprises, the missing middle. Now, the missing middle spans from enterprises looking for money equaling 50,000 US dollars to 2 million US dollars. And as on the graph, you would see in dark blue is the money flowing to SMEs who are working on export value chains. And in green, it's the money flowing to SMEs that are producing fruits, vegetables, grains, and feed for domestic consumption. And that green bar is where we need to increase the flow of financing to show up food security. And to enable this flow, we must have much greater participation from local lenders and local banks. Maurizio gave you some percentages of how much local lending is actually going to agri-food SMEs. It's not big. And to gear up those local lenders, to provide them with incentives, to provide them with technical assistance and capacity building, we need the DFIs, the development finance institutions, to be the big players. We want them to come forward. We want them to take more risks. And the issue currently being debated at the top levels of policymaking is 
how the development financial institutions can maintain their high credit ratings, adhere to their prudential rules and governance structures, but yet take more risks. So one question the inquiry asks is, should development finance institutions be given these extra pools of financing with which they can take more risks? And there is the example already from France, where the development finance institution Propaco has been given an additional pool of capital under the FARM pillar of France to do exactly that, to take more risk. And to enable now all this to happen, I've tried to weave a little ecosystem here for us. SMEs re receiving more money, local lenders getting involved, and the development finance institutions pulling and pushing the ecosystem by providing assistance. For all that to happen, is it sensible? Is it wise? Is it necessary to have some level of aggregation across overseas development assistance providers, the donors? If donors could work together to reduce transaction costs, to bring together ideas, opportunities, and money, would that be the game changer that we're looking for to move from $1 to $4 of innovative financing for food and ag? Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Over to you, Karen. Thank you, Ashani. Four very strong messages. Focus on the missing middle, enable local lenders, help the DFIs, the development finance institutions, take more risks and support that with a multi-donor working group and knowledge hub that tries to collect knowledge and resources. So our next two speakers um, were actually involved in the inquiry or interviewed in the inquiry. They're joining us online. Um, we have Peter Bees, who's the program manager and regional thematic advisor for the Swiss Development uh, Cooperation, SDC. And we have David Duez, who's a managing partner at Incofin. And Incofin is an impact investor who is investing in agri SMEs. So, um, Peter, I might start with you. Um, having heard what Oshani has said and being one of the donor agencies who is being quite catalytic in, in how they're using uh, their public money, can you share with us a bit more about how SDC is trying to be more innovative in how you finance food system transformation? Uh, with pleasure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, SDC is a, a small bilateral donor from Switzerland, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, and we have different programs that are in the direction of impact-linked finance. And probably the most interesting one is ACELI, uh, ACELI Africa, where SDC is co-financing with other donors. And uh, the ACELI example is very telling because they are exactly aiming at this missing middle. Um, they are exactly aiming at um, uh, uh, agro-processing cooperatives, uh, all these kind of SMEs that reach out to, um, to thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of smallholder farmers. And the idea behind Arceli is uh, to provide incentives for local financial uh, institutions to lend to these companies. You have heard the reasons why this is not done. It's because risks are perceived too high or are too high and because costs, transaction costs are too high. And that's exactly where our city uh, comes in. Uh, plus, of course, technical assistance. Technical assistance is provided um, as well to the investors as uh, to the investees, the SMEs. So uh, technical assistance aside, uh, let's talk about risk. So what Asili is doing in, in uh, four, uh, now going to the fifth country in Africa, in East Africa, uh, in East and South Africa, is they provide to local financial institutions a loan loss, an additional loan loss reserve on a reserve conto uh, account. So if uh, and then, and, uh, um, uh, the financial intermediary enters in a loan agreement, uh, they can apply to Aceli and say, look, this first time I'm, I'm providing a loan here, 
can you please help me? And then depending on whether it's the first time or the second time, whether it's high impact or lower impact, they receive a certain percentage additional loan loss reserve on a reserve account with Aseli. So that's lowering the entry barrier for them. And the second uh, important thing that, that uh, they are doing is they are providing so-called origination incentives or social impact incentives. That means if, um, as we as we have heard, it's just impossible for some financial intermediaries to to lend to uh, to SMEs because it's it's too costly. So nobody can be expected to lose money on lending uh, lending money out. Okay. So um, what they are providing is something between two thousand and sixteen thousand, depending on whether that's the first time or second time, or whether it's high impact or low impact. Uh, 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 additional payment if this uh, loan is done. So if you're lending as a financial intermediary uh, to a certain enterprise, a social, uh, so a small and medium enterprise, then you can uh, receive an, an origination incentive uh, so, so that you're not loss making. Uh, that, that's that's a very simple idea and that makes uh, tilt the balance so that really uh, these, these financial intermediaries are doing this. And it's referring a little bit to what was shown before, the green ones, uh, the, the, the domestic market. Um, this is covered as well because um, it's local currency. So it's local financial intermediaries that are providing these loans. So it's done in local car currency. You are not dependent on, on dollar revenues because you're providing a dollar loan. So, so that's a story in a short. It's working very well. Um, you may ask yourself what we understand uh, by, by impact, high impact. Uh, you all know the principles for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems. SDC is adhering to this. Uh, we like this very much. Uh, so, so based on this, uh, food security, um, uh, ag ag uh, climate smart agriculture, gender equality, all these are aspects where then an additional impact payment is, is, is provided or an additional loan loss reserve uh, can, can be provided. And this works uh, very well for uh, a few years since now uh, at a significant scale. As I said at the beginning, these project funds for technical assistance, loan loss reserve, project management, and of course these origination incentives for the first phase is $64 million. Uh, so 10 only from SDC, the rest comes from the, from, from other important uh, players. Um, and it, it has the potential to be replicated and scaled, uh, of course, because um, the, the, uh, you have seen how big the gap is. And even with 64 million and a leverage factor of fee, fee four, you wouldn't get that far. In this case, the leverage factor is even better. We started in the beginning with 10 or 11 as an assumption, but it went down to nine because uh, uh, luckily or, or fortunately, the ticket size is really small. So this is really working for small loans to, to small and medium enterprises. So we're not talking about the 2 billion, but le le much less uh, below 100,000. So, so that's really interesting. And still uh, quite high leverage factor of the money used by uh, the, 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 the project that is then crowding in or, or getting into the game, the local private financial intermediaries with a factor of almost 10. So uh, I stop here. Thank you, Peter. I would have some follow-up questions. I want to turn to David for a minute, but two of the questions that came to my mind is, is you said it's working, but we're still only at the millions and our financing gap is in the billions. So with such small projects, how do we get to where we need to move from the millions to the billions? That was my, fir my first thought. And my second thought is, how do you make sure as you're covering these local lenders that you're not subsidizing banks that would be lending otherwise um, how do you make sure that this finance you're providing is truly additional rather than just a subsidy for local lenders? So I'll let you think about that and I'll briefly turn to David from Incofin, which is an impact investment, investor, um, to sort of tell us a bit more about your experience with this so-called missing middle that we heard Maurizio and Oshani refer to. What, what's working, what's not working? And what's your experience with these blended funds? Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm unfortunately not present there. I'm uh, joining from Colombia, from Bogota. Uh, regarding your questions, um, 
I think it's important to really remind us uh, about the, the vital role of SMEs in production, processing, and distribution of food. Uh, in, the, in a lot of countries, it's more than 70% of the food who's really produced, delivered by SMEs. Despite this, in fact, uh, the funding gap for SMEs is enormous. There are many reasons for that. Uh, sometimes they are too big for microfinance institutions, too small, too risky, or too expensive, as Peter just mentioned, for commercial banks, but also for impact investment funds. And when funding is available, financial products are not always tailored for the needs of these SMEs. Uh, they, for instance, need loans based upon their cash flow or capacity of repayments and their project, and not really based on securities. And this is very often how many lenders look at them. So the, the funding gap is even larger. Uh, and I think that's what Oshani mentioned earlier for local SMEs targeting domestic food consumption. And this is also because perceived risk is higher for these companies versus those that are trading or producing for exports. So supporting local value chain, in my view, is essential to promote food security and, and promote food independence in, in many countries. So that's regarding the, the SME side. On the blending finance uh, uh, question, I would say that what we see as private sector is a, an increasing interest and genuine interest in supporting food systems transformation and supporting sustainable agriculture in general in developing countries. However, we have to recognize that private sector tend to be concerned about country risk. Uh, the risk profile of many SMEs is also concerned about the risk return trade-off uh, in investing in food systems in developing countries. Private sector pays importance also to liquidity. So by investing, they need to ensure that there are liquidity options for them. And when looking at impact, let's not forget about impact, they need clear and understandable, but also very measurable uh, indicators. So that means that for us, uh, it requires genuine partnership between donors and private sector um, in order to reach this four times leverage that Oshani mentioned, or even more, and become more impactful. Uh, from our perspective, it requires donor ready to contribute to, to first loss or guarantee scheme in order to mitigate somehow credit or foreign ex exchange risks. It requires donors to be ready to invest in long term. Uh, this required to channel. This is required to channel long term funding for SMEs, and that's very often one of the biggest gap. In fact, the longest term uh, financing. It also requires donors to be ready to provide non-financial support to SME programs, such as capacity building, technical assistance. And last but not least, I would say developing innovative solutions requires heavy investments in research and development, pipeline building, methodology, and so on. So from our experience as impact fund manager, we would really uh, appreciate donors to consider supporting uh, private sector in developing innovative solutions, developing new impact funds. Um, so I think that's what I wanted to say uh, uh, in this intervention. Thank you very much. So, um, Peter, I'm going to come back to you because I think David's raised a lot of these issues. He's now put a lot more of the onus back on donors. So we keep asking donors to do more and more and more, and they've got less and less and less, and they're more constrained. So how do we marry this divide is the first question to you. And then the second question is, how do we manage that risk that you don't end up using public taxpayer money to finance private sector's profit-making objectives? Yeah, your uh, your questions are both excellent. Uh, scaling is 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 always our ambition. Um, yeah, the the first point is here that this project is working in four countries. is going now to a fifth. Um, there is negotiation with partners in Latin America to go back to Latin America. It started there. Now it would go back there. Set up a similar program. Uh, 
the principle of working is relatively easily, as, as I explained. So that can be extended to other countries and it can be increased in the countries it is. The big question is where does the money come from, right? And um, part of the RCD program is as well to work on data and policy dialogue to see how we can improve the regulatory framework and as well, how can we lobby local governments to put in money into these outcome payments? Uh, it's a question of effectiveness. What do you think is more effective? Uh, expensive rural advisory services or perhaps a cheap um, or expensive subsidies to a fertilizer or, 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 or fuels, gasoline for, for, for diesel pumps, this kind of thing? Or is it perhaps better spent on, on a scheme like this? Where with a few thousand dollars, you would channel a loan to a, uh, to a SME that buys from hundreds of farmers and grows and creates additional income come, uh, with a factor of two, five, four, uh, whatever, much higher. Uh, so, so I think that's that's a little bit the, the, the big challenge we have ahead of us with all political economy aspects attached. So uh, I think local governments need to co-finance uh, donors should, of course, um, and then there may be the private sector corporates willing to uh, to put money in as well. Imagine if you are concerned about your value chain, about your stability of your value chain, maybe it's a good idea to spend a few thousand dollars on this kind of thing uh, to get more uh, smallholder farmers as suppliers for your value chain. So that's, I think, where these money can come from and where we then go to scaling. Uh, replication, uh, making bigger projects in the existing ones, getting uh, additional payers uh, uh, in addition to the to the donors, uh, philanthropy and donors, which are too small. Um, that's the way forward for massive scaling. And by the way, we are already at leveraging some some 600, 700 million dollars of of loans into the sector. It's a start. It's still not billions, but it's already hundreds of millions. So that's the first point. Um, um, where we increasingly need to work to make us uh, uh, less important, the donors, and, and, and get the others on board. Second point is, uh, what about windfalls or subsidizing the private sector? Uh, where we have laws, we are not allowed to subsidize profit making in, in, in principle. Um, but let's be a little bit, let's talk about eff efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, you can, the, the ideal subsidy would be just exactly what it needs uh, to cover this financial gap. So if somebody is losing uh, on a loan to a small and medium enterprise, uh, $5,315, uh, I should not provide uh, more than exactly this amount. Uh, less probably not, because otherwise the financial intermediary would not provide the loan. Uh, how to get the, the, the information? Do the financial intermediaries know this in, uh, this precise amount or not? And and there we are in the in the in the middle of efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, imagine I can create several jobs or increase the income of hundred smallholder farmers with a subsidy of five thousand three hundred fifteen, or even if it costs six thousand, that's extremely effective, isn't it? It's it's uh, the cost benefit analysis is quickly done. Uh, this will overtake by far the public uh, public money. So if the financial intermediary receives a little windfall here, okay. And if they don't know precisely each and single uh, cost of this loan, sometimes they lose, sometimes they, they win. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a perfect model, we would tender out the, the subsidy, right? And then when people would apply and per perhaps some would go for 4,900 uh, and we could then uh, allocate the money accordingly. In the meantime, with no, 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 no perfect data. We'll never have uh, perfect data, and, and and high transaction costs of administering uh, these kind of schemes. We need to find if, if efficient, effective, pragmatic uh, solutions, and I think this goes into this direction. There's of course always uh, potential for improving, but um, uh, th that's what we what we need to do. And perhaps a, a last I'm time. Put you up there because I'd like to yep. move on. Sorry, Sorry, but thank you. I mean, two very strong messages. One I'm interpreting as part of this whole repurposing subsidies agenda that we've heard about for years now. Stop subsidizing the bad kinds of incentives, fossil fuels, fertilizers, and start using it more effectively and try to really, the second point was really being key in trying to use those resources more 
um, efficiently by really only covering that gap that's preventing the private sector coming in rather than going too far. Um, I want to turn now to our examples in South Africa and, and in Nepal. Um, we've got with us today um, Dr. Ivan Meyer, from, who's the Minister of Agriculture and Leader of Government Business at the Western Capes Department of Agriculture, and Dr. Mogale Sebopetsa, who's the Head of Department also at the Western Cape Department of Agriculture. Um, can you share with us the, the, the experience that you're having on how you're trying to bring in finance to smallholders? The presentation loaded. Right. Uh, firstly, good afternoon, everybody. Well, what we have here is you will see that we speak at this conference about food security. And we know that food security has six dimensions. All of you are familiar with this, that all the people at all the times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their needs and food preferences. If this was happening, this conference would not have happened because the outgoing chairperson this morning of CFS said there's a global emergency and this is no ordinary crisis. And so we in the Western Cape, where I'm the minister of one of our provinces, have identified three areas for priorities. Number one, jobs. Number two, safety. Number three, well-being. And for us, I think the one single message that I want you to remember from this presentation is this. Food insecurity is a risk for democracy, and political stability of nations. Thus, nations must unite behind the global efforts in making a difference in food security and nutrition. And what we want to present to you today, is the next slide, is the institutional arrangements that draws multiple spheres of government and the private sector, it's understanding its unique roles, working from the same plan and achieving the same outcomes. Dr. Sebo Petsim, our head of the department, will now explain how we do this institutionally in terms of working together towards the same plan, achieving the same outcomes. I now hand over to my head of the department, Dr. Mukhale Sebo Petsim. Thank you very much. And, um Good afternoon. I think what the minister referred to is an institutional arrangement that brings together multiple stakeholders to drive change within agriculture. But now, can the slides move, please? Keep going, they're bringing them up again. Sure. <clears throat> now, maybe somebody may ask what is the benefit of this system that we call a commodity approach? It's a system, in our view, that um, creates an ecosystem of support, particularly for smallholder farmers. When we were asked to give a quote, the quote that I provided was that um, Commercialization of smaller farmers is possible through innovation and partnerships, and um, we've got the evidence at the Western Cape. Now, this system brings to the fore commodity expert information that uh, support farmers in the work that they need to do, but more importantly, mentorship support to new farmers. In other words, generation uh, getting together in terms of agriculture. But thirdly, and most important, is the whole issue of market access. I'm sure many of you in the room would understand that uh, it wouldn't help agriculture if farmers produce and are not able to sell their produce. It was in the words of Mr. Swami Nathan, may his soul rest in peace, who said if agriculture goes wrong, nothing else will go right. So it becomes very important that uh, market access becomes very key in terms of the work that we do. 
But this ecosystem also creates hope in the Western Cape, but also brings to the fore the fact that land reform can be successful. And in the Western Cape, we've got evidence to support that land reform is succeeding <clears throat> where we are working together with our industry partners. But of course, the whole issue of jobs in the rural landscape, we've seen increase in terms of people getting employment through this model. But of significance <clears throat> to this conversation is the fact that uh, commodity formations brings resources to the tune of over 540 US 40,000 USD, and in our <clears throat> terms, it's about 10 million rents that they bring to the fore on annual basis. Now, what are, what are the lessons <clears throat> that, that we have learned over the years? Is that uh, strategic partnership and collaboration is key for smallholder development and therefore sustainable food system. We have seen that happening uh, in the Western Cape. But of significance, and I think it was also shared by <clears throat> the Shemba Center colleagues in terms of blended finance, that uh, government on its own cannot drive agriculture, but government need to work <clears throat> together with the private sector to ensure that agriculture progresses. And that's what we have seen in the Western Cape. But of course, the whole issue of market access, training and exposure in terms of international standards uh, create successful agriculture. In the Western Cape, about 55% of what is exported by our country, South Africa, most of that comes from the province of the Western Cape. But also we have learned that over time, we needed to constantly reevaluate uh, the assumptions that were made or are continu continuously made when projects of agriculture are being uh, drafted. Farmer to farmer extension um, approach was deepened in the sense that uh, in literature would tell you from this very house that uh, farmers tend to learn much better when they are taught or they learn from their own uh, counterparts. Of course, in this model, we have also learned to accept the reality that farmers, particularly new farmers, will make mistakes. But uh, the most important thing is that they need to learn from those mistakes and be able to, uh, to move forward. The last point I want to make before I hand over to the minister is the issue of uh, land reform success and the evidence that we have in the Western Cape that 72% of the land reform enterprises that we have supported over time had been successful. And this was based on external evaluations with over 39 um, indicators that were measured over time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, to briefly conclude, I was before a minister of finance. You can no more come and cry before a budget committee for money. We are no more persuaded by your emotional reactions of people dying in a hospital or people not having food. And that's why we have now adopted data and evidence approach. The point that you raised, there's less money. You have to make a case. Your case must be persuasive. Earlier this morning, the outgoing chair spoke also about the need for evidence base, increasing the focus on research. One of the panel members on the virtual platform spoke about that. We have adopted another approach called BOZA. BOZA is whole of society approach. Not all the problems that happen in the government is your problem. We, we need a whole of society approach. Everybody must take part in their, act in their responsibility. But not only BOZA, we also have WOGA, whole of government approach. I'm the minister at the provincial level but there's my director general at the national level. I must work with him. One of the colleagues on the panel now spoke about working with municipalities, whole of government at different levels working together. We launched a program, one home, one garden. Everyone must have a garden. Everyone must have a vegetable garden. I started one at my home as a minister. I must lead by example. The government has no more money. So start your garden, we can give you a small, a seed pack, less money. We can do three things for you. Test your soil, test your water, and give you free advice. We heard it now on the platform. But I also have here, I can't do everything on my own. That's why we need partners, as Dr. Sebo Petzer said. I'm very happy. Understand the role of commercial agriculture. The chief executive officer 
of commercial agriculture in the Western Cape is here. Mr. Yanni Stradom. Mr. Yanni, can you raise your hand? Commercial agriculture is my partner in food security. But I also have the chief executive officer of Casidra, an implementation agency working in communities, rolling out vegetable gardens. Dr. Keith, can you raise your hand? These are partners, whole of society, whole of government approach. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, Dr. Sebopetsa. Some very important messages. I think, uh, Dr. Meyer, your first most important message was that food insecurity is a risk for democracy and political stability, political instability. Um, you showed how important the land reform has been to your commercialization strategy. And you've showed us also how important that export oriented strategy is. But as we saw earlier, it's easier to get that finance for the export oriented agriculture than it is for the agriculture for domestic consumption. So is really your answer, everybody has to have their home garden and become a farmer? Is that how we're gonna fill that financing gap for domestic consumption? Or are there other ways to do it? I'm gonna let you think about that. I'd like to turn to um, Siddharth Kadka, who's the community manager for the Commercial Agriculture for Smallholders and Agribusiness, or CASA project of the UK's FCDO. Um, and he's gonna uh, share with us the experience of CASA in Nepal. Siddharth, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, one of our sorry. Uh, one of our main areas of work in Nepal is to demonstrate the commercial viability of agri SMEs to investors, and I will present an example of how we do this uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, in the background, I have I have some information to give you some context on investment and SMEs in Nepal, uh, but generally, you know, investor confidence is low in agriculture and SMEs in Nepal, uh, primarily due to uh, you know, low productivity and competitiveness among agribusinesses in Nepal. Uh, given this context, uh, we focus our work in three key areas. Uh, the first is about sourcing these agribusinesses, you know, uh, building a solid pipeline of investable businesses that we can share with investors. Uh, then we work on improving firm capability of uh, selected agribusinesses uh, to enhance their ability to borrow from formal channels, uh, but also to increase their productivity and competitiveness. Uh, then, do we, then finally, we do a lot of uh, investor scouting and matchmaking as well. And uh, let me give you an example of an agribusiness in Nepal uh, called uh, Poincho Puzzle to demonstrate how this works uh, in practice. Uh, in terms of sourcing, uh, as you can see in the slide, well, we try to identify and work with businesses which want to pilot new business model, which aggregate a lot of smallholder farmers, or you know, or look to work with existing proven uh, business model with a large number of smallholder supply chain. Uh, in the case with Mojo, we worked with them to secure the required finances to expand their operations uh, to include even more smallholder farmers uh, into their supply chain. Uh, so this is how they were working uh, when we started with them. And uh, this is this is what we wanted to do with them. You know, include more more small smallholders supply suppliers into their supply chain, produce more, and then eventually sell more sell more as well. Uh, once we identified uh, Point Chubasal as a potential partner, we worked on improving their uh, firm capability to improve productivity and competitiveness. Uh, one of our key takeaways uh, working with SMEs in Nepal have has been that they need to enhance their overall capability uh, to effectively develop, attract investment, and grow. Uh, our support to SMEs for improving capability is, of course, uh, tailored depending on their individual need. Uh, but in case of Poincho, we focused, again, in four key areas. Uh, the first was to strengthen their internal governance and firm capacity to enhance their you know, ability to uh, borrow from formal channel channels, uh, things like uh, building their financial capacity and transparency, uh, developing business plans and investment memorandum, and also introducing technology uh, into their internal processes. Uh, we worked uh, 
After this, we worked on strengthening their supply chain by expanding their geographic coverage to include more smallholder farmers, uh, providing trainings on things like good agriculture practices, post-harvest management, and also introducing climate smart technology to you know, increase quality as well as quantity at the, at the farm level. Uh, simultaneously, we worked with Poincho in their firm level operations to ramp up production and improve, uh, and improve product, product quality. Uh, this included support to enhance operational processes and labor productivity, new product development, as well as obtaining national and international quality certifications. Uh, with production up, uh, we looked at improving their knowledge about business opportunities and marketing, uh, focusing things like uh, branding, market research, and customer feedback loop. Uh, we also looked at establishing more business-to-business -business transaction and also export potential for their process products. Uh, finally, for the continuation of financing, uh, we intensified their engagement with investors as well. And we did this uh, just so that they have a better understanding of the requirements of different investors and different financing options and, and vice versa. And uh, so talking about results, uh, Poincho was, Poincho secured over 300,000 uh, in finances through two rounds of finances from commercial banks. Uh, they also raised an additional 100,000 uh, pounds from their own shareholders as a capital injection uh, for their expansion. Uh, they established multiple retail outlets and collection centers at remote locations and were able to add almost uh, 10,000 new smallholder farmers in, into their supply chain. Uh, they've also seen an increase of about 65% in their sales and revenue. And uh, also at present, we have about five or six equity investors, you know, looking at the business for investment opportunities. Uh, I will stop there and uh, leave this last slide uh, to give you an idea of uh, CASA's work and some of the achievements uh, we have so far. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank, thank you for that, um, that, that very detailed and good example. But again, we're talking in the thousands and we need to reach the billions. We're talking about individual cases. How do we scale this thing up? How do we make it systemic? Um, how do we move from individual cases to something bigger? Do any of the three of you want to come in on that? I would very much like to respond to the issue that you raised about market access. When I became the Minister of Agriculture in the Western Cape, my boss, the Premier of the province, gave me a target he said, you must increase exports from my province by 5%. It was 45%. He said, I must increase it by 5%, in other words, to 50%. I'm happy to report that I now stand at 55% of all South Africa's primary agricultural exports come from my region, thanks to our farmers and our agri-workers. What 5% increase in exports mean, 20 2,000 new jobs. New jobs, export-led growth, means less people dependent on state subsidies and state support. More people in work means more food security at household level. So that's how you scale it up. 22,000. I have achieved the 10% increase, so 40,000 people are now having food security. That's how you scale it up from an export growth perspective. But Dr. Sebo Petzer would like to respond to the second part of your question. Thanks, uh, Karen. I think it's important to underscore the fact that South Africa's food problem is not a production problem. It's food access problem. We are as a nation a net exporter. So, so for us, the strategy of solving it is also including a job creation, a solution. So the one home, one garden strategy is the one way of lessening um, people's dependence on the formal food value chain, because they are able to then produce and eat um, from their own, their own backyards. So it's important that that is understood uh, in the context of the Western Cape and South Africa. We are a net exporter, 
We need those exports because then jobs are created. But equally important is to understand that uh, the food production strategy is to lessen that dependence and thereby increase um, food and, and nutrition security. Thanks. Thank you. I do want to open the floor. I know there's uh, donors and development banks in the room, but before I open the floor, I would like to turn to our last part of this session, which is about the cost of inaction, and give the floor to Siddharth Krishnaswamy, who's the head of research, analysis, and monitoring at the East Africa Regional Office for the World Food Program. Um, he's going to talk to us about what happens when we when there's not enough money, um, the cost of inaction. Siddharth, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, two Siddharths for the price of one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, this study, this work, is actually part of a, a far bigger uh, piece of work. It's being led by my colleague also in the audience, Chinsia, from the World Food Program Regional Bureau. Uh, it includes University of California, Davis, it includes Virginia Tech, and so on. But today, we're just going to come up with a, a few things, keeping it very much at 30,000 feet, just to show you the flip side. What happens when the money does not come? What happens when the funding does not happen? But through the lens of the World Food Program. So we are using our own data to, to sort of mathematically show the impacts of inaction. Uh, sorry. Uh, very briefly, uh, when we talk about food security in the numbers, we're talking about the IPC classification and so on. But the main takeaway from this slide, if you look, is that the past couple of years has seen such an uh, escalation of food insecurity. Uh, today, we are at least 63 million, and this is just the Eastern Africa region. And this, this uh, trajectory is also mirrored in other regions. You can take the Middle East, you can take Southern Africa, and so on. But this is what is alarming, has been in the past few years, the rate at which hunger is multiplied. Uh, whether it's because of conflict, whether it's because of drought, whether it's, I mean, it's not always one driver, but all these drivers have, have led to this. Uh, and today we're at 62 million. You'll see that it's actually a slight improvement in, in again, in Eastern Africa, because the, the drought ended. But we are, we are looking at El Nino now and the flooding, and we're expecting uh, deterioration again. But even now at 62 million, it's a massive figure. And what does it mean for funding? What does it mean for WFP? Again, I won't bore you with too many numbers. Oh, sorry. So for our, my organization, it costs, in 2021, it costs 61 cents per day to, to give the basic amount of assistance, 61 cents per beneficiary but we could only afford 43 cents. Now, I'm, 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 we are aggregating figures, but what it means is instead of giving the bare minimum, you're giving less than, and that's 43 cents. And if you convert that into kilocalories, you're not even giving half the amount, a little more than half the amount that a person needs. And that was in 2021. 2022, thanks to the war in Ukraine, thanks to transportation costs spiraling out, fuel uh, shortages, it's become 81 cents. So what this really means is not only are aid agencies, whether it's WFP, whether it's another UN, whether it's a government, we're not able to get funding to even give the bare minimum, and we've got to cut corners. And that is what leads to further repercussions such as this. If you just look at this, the, the circle, the pie chart on the left, the cycle, you have your, in our case, it's WFP, so the beneficiary caseload, you have funding shortfalls, so you provide insufficient assistance. This is, this is normal. But what is less seen is what happens to these people who are receiving insufficient assistance, not receiving any assistance, and then a shock happens, another shock, right? Whether it's conflict, whether it's food prices, inflation, whether it's underemployment getting worse. And then you get into the cycle where the numbers keep spiraling up, like you saw in the first slide, and it doesn't really need any new conflict. It can be something very minor, which will continue this slide. And then what aid agencies do, in our case, again, in WFP, you start making these, these uh, you start taking these calls on who gets to eat, 
who gets assistance, who doesn't? Among the people who get assistance, how long do you assist them for? If you've got to assist them for a longer time, you've got to cut down the food. If you want to assist them now, now, like in Somalia, then you've got to give them full rations, but you can only assist them for the next three months. So these are the kind of decisions you end up making. And in Somalia, this is again an ongoing work by the University of California and us. You could see that people who didn't receive assistance, you could see that what they were doing was short-term coping strategies that are going to erode their resilience. So they sell assets, they pull children out of school, they, they cut corners, they sell livestock. None of these things can be done for too long. But they are forced to do that because there's no other ob uh, opportunity. They're not getting assistance. They're not, the government is un unable to, to, to help all of them because of the numbers. Agencies are not. Donors are unable to. So this is where we end up. And the other thing that we saw the big difference was that food becomes the only expenditure for many households. Health, medicine, education are all luxuries, unfortunately. And again, this kind of pattern, when you see it go for a longer time, you end up with the spiraling. If you know about the IPC phase classifications, people start moving from three, four, five, simply because of this inaction. And what we really need to underline the messages is that it's as, a, as, a, uh, as actors in the development sector, be it government, be it an NGO, be it the UN, it's cheaper. If you have to just bring it down, forget about the morality, just in dollars and cents, it's cheaper to act now than pay much more to act later. I will leave, I will end on that note, just to, it's just a summary of all what I talked about, uh, about the cost of inaction. If you translate it into, into numbers, uh, 25 million people did not receive any assistance. Uh, this was in, in uh, last year, 2022. But if you go back a year earlier, about 10 million people didn't receive assistance. 10 million is doubled. And as this doubling goes, you are going to see this burden get bigger and bigger, and more and more money will be needed uh, to address the problem, say, three years down the road. And, and worse, the, the inaction now also erodes whatever gains we have made in the, in the past few years. Sorry to make this all so doom, so, such a lot of doom and gloom, but these are the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. And yeah, I think your, your last words echo that sentiment. We end on a very gloomy picture of what happens when we don't make those investments upfront and earlier and to invest in that longer term resilience building. Um, and I think everybody in this room here knows about those growing hunger numbers, especially the acute food insecurity numbers. But um, thank you for, for making it so, so real. Um, I, I think I'll open the floor now and then we'll come back to the panel so we can hear from people. Um, so I will, I'll only open the floor to people in the room, so apologies for those that are watching virtually, but I would like to give people an opportunity to ask questions or to make comments, especially if you are a donor or a DFI, and you've got other experiences on how you're making your financing more catalytic. I think that would be a welcome addition to this, um, this panel. So the floor is open. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Karin. Uh, this is Radio Save with the FCDO. I'm actually uh, responsible for the FCDO for the CASA program that CDART has, I mean, the first CDART, apologies, has, uh, has uh, told us uh, about. So happy to break the ice as I saw that there was not uh, someone else uh, ready to grab the microphone. And uh, 
and make two, two very quick points. Um, so one is that um, the practice of, of, uh, of investment in these uh, so-called missing middle um, type of companies uh, will dramatically depend on the local uh, condition of credit. So from CASA program, the situation that Siddharth has described to us uh, for Nepal is completely different from uh, what the same program finds in Malawi, Ethiopia, or Rwanda. Uh, dramatically different. So interest rates could be three times as big in one country compared to the other, uh, which uh, is something that completely wipes away every other consideration that we might want to do, of course. Um, and the second is that um, although I agree that we should be um, uh, remove those subsidies that may induce um, wrong in incentives, uh, so for example on fossil fuels or undue profit, uh, I also believe as, uh, sorry I can't remember the name of the speaker on screen, that an element of subsidy is, is a must, is unavoidable if you're looking um, at solving the problems that you've, you've been presenting uh, today. So uh, carrying your question about how can we avoid uh, subsidizing some companies locally that would have uh, invested anyways. So to me, the answer is that we can't avoid that if we want those companies to invest. Um, um, uh, it, it would be more for DFIs to start considering how um, the need for return on capital in the long term should be probably um, rethought, at least for these type of sectors. Uh, I, I mean, if I if I look at any of the bilateral uh, DFIs like uh, uh, the British um, International Investment or uh, or the, the the similar from other from other countries, uh, it's very clear that the type of condition of, of investment that they apply to different sectors, take, uh, I don't know, renewable energy and agriculture with that 70% base of smallholders for food production that has been mentioned, the same condition cannot apply. But return on capital must be different. Otherwise, it's a no starter. Thank you. Thank you. Three important messages. The local conditions matter. We cannot avoid subsidizing companies. And there's a need for a big rethinking on the return on capital, particularly from the development finance institutions. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for breaking the ice there. Um, Shantanu Mathur, formerly of IFAD. Uh, just wanted to, well, give a little vote of thanks to, to start with to the GDPRD platform and to you, Karen, for, for so ably uh, moderating this very exciting and very rich discussion. Your incisive questions also helped a lot in improving our and refining our understanding. Uh, of, of the scenarios of, of results that ought to be scaled up. So it was great to, you know, learn about de-risking, which is so key right now. Um, subsidies, if subsidies is a bad word, then perhaps smart subsidies, uh, you know, which can be tapered off or at least are more precise in creating that incentive structure for private sector financing. Um, but I think what is mission critical for all of this is scaling up agenda. And what occurred to me um, while, while listening to you and the call was that, you know, GDPRD is precisely the type of platform that can provide the, 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 the knowledge broker type of function here. This is a great knowledge sharing event by itself, but 
not just more of this, but a more formal, more structured approach to identifying the kind of donors, and I'm talking about EFAD in particular, the, with that works in the kind of ecosystems that we were just listening to. Uh, it's got an investment portfolio of upwards of 1.5 billion a year now. Uh, or maybe a more precise figure might come from Bettina right there. Uh, and the idea is to, to, to try and inform the design of this investment portfolio whenever we can, where we can find the, the, you know, the right uh, local conditions uh, where this can be replicated or scaled up and scaled out. Um, and that, I think, is one way of, of, of looking at sca the scaling point agenda there through blending, blended finance, et cetera, piggybacking the investment portfolio of EFARs, the bank, the regional banks, et cetera. Thank you. So Thank piggybacking you. on some of the 1.5 billion that IFAD is giving, very key recommendation. Can I take one more comment or question? We're gonna end a little bit late because we um, started late. I've got two more, so I'll take one and then two. Uh, thank you. My name is Katarina Eriksson. I represent Tetra Pak, uh, Food for Development. Um, I, I just want to, to, to raise the, um, the question of technical assistance in combination with investments. And many of the development banks we know uh, de-risk some of their investments by also providing technical assistance in the value chains. And, and this is something we are working with a lot in with our customers, working upstream with our dairy customers, uh, suppliers, uh, smallholders, and we have our own specialists uh, providing training of extension officers and so on. And in many cases in partnership. So maybe not a question, but to highlight that uh, for investments to be effective and maybe less risky, uh, that we should not uh, forget technical assistance. And it has been mentioned many times, but to, to make that connection, thank you. Thank you, and I think very much the example that Siddharth gave was very much a case of a lot of technical assistance, but thank you for re repeating that message about the importance of technical assistance um, supporting those, the, the more commercial investments. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Julian Lafetti from the World Bank. So a, a couple of thoughts from my side, first being that you know, there's 600 million farms in the world, 500 million of which are small, and there's 8 billion consumers. And so you essentially have the largest private sector in the world right there. There's millions of industries between those farms and consumers. So it, one of the first questions one wants to ask is, what are the things that are preventing more credit going into that space? And there's plenty of consumers and producers. And does that vary wildly by country? Is there a typology of countries that help you understand that landscape? And why aren't the impact investors in the scale way? And I think if we want to scale this thing, we need to understand what the diagnostic category is. Second point I would make is that you know, this idea of repurposing subsidies is really around the idea of paying the farmers and the producers to produce public goods, clean water, less uh, greenhouse gases, nutrition, so on and so forth. And if we manage to figure out how to pay those producers to do those things, they can increase their income, so greater sustainability, and it can improve their access to credit because they will have other sources of income on just farming activity. So I would think that there may be a very productive space related to ESG agriculture getting impact investors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do any of our panelists want to respond to some of the comments before I close? Yes, Dr. Meyer. 
thank you very much. I'm also concerned about the issue of the investors. Given the scale of agriculture, annually I look at gross fixed capital formation, number of investment in agriculture, and I see marginal increases, not because what I heard here, it's a crisis, so you don't want incremental marginal uh, investments into agriculture. But I uh, recently met with uh, our top researchers in agriculture in South Africa, trying to understand your question. Well, they gave me the following six reasons. There's war, renewable energy, animal health and biosecurity, extreme weather conditions, climate change, the global trade environment, and the global economy and inflation. So they have uh, not a very high appetite to work in this environment. So that's the answer they gave me to your question whether it has universal application, maybe not, but at least that is the answer that I got uh, from uh, that uh, particular situation. Yes, I do think that one of the comments that I heard here is that we need to uh, incentivize the right policies, particularly in agriculture. Uh, the issue of subsidies is a very important issue. We don't get any subsidies in South Africa, our farmers, and yet we have to compete globally in Europe, 55% of our Western Cape agriculture from my province goes globally into the world. No subsidy. So you can imagine how competitive our farmers are. And you can imagine how stressful our farmers must be to cooperate in an environment like this. Exports before the war in uh, Ukraine took us about uh, 23 days to export. After the war, it's 93 days because every container need to be searched for explosives and weapons, another cost into the uh, cost for the, for the uh, export. So yes, I am also annually looking as a minister at gross fixed capital formation. The small margin that I've seen was on netting uh, because of extreme weather conditions, but that is not enough significant. We need more significant investment because in this, uh, CFS, I heard the following things, uh, Karen. Number one, I heard that global, there's a global emergency. The second thing that I heard, this is not another crisis. The third thing that I heard is we need bold action. The fourth thing I heard at this workshop, we need global scientific efforts. And lastly, I heard that we need urgency. I hope that we can need also urgency in the investment part of agriculture, given the scale and the magnitude of the clients that you refer to. Thank you, Oshani. Capital formation at the domestic level is key. So I totally concur with the speakers who highlighted high interest rates in low income countries. When there are high interest rates, banks buy sovereign bonds and they sit on them. It's very difficult to wet their appetite to go that extra mile, take the trouble to lead to agri-SMEs. I also totally concur with the speakers bringing up the importance of ESG, ESG disclosure, ESG risk understanding, understanding the exposure of large companies and value change to climate change, to biodiversity loss, to unemployment, to soil degradation. If you're not understanding the exposure to risk, Karen, we cannot scale. There's simply no way we cannot scale. So one way, one small drop in this bucket of water is going to be how can we provide hedging guarantees for local currencies? How can we hedge local currency investments. We need much more mobilization on that. We can't leave it to TCX alone. That will change markets. That will change action on the ground. That would bring some small movement towards scale. Lending in local currencies. And I'm guessing that's not just from the domestic lenders, but also from the development finance institutions being willing to lend in local currencies. Very strong message. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Our time's coming up. 
I, I think um, this has been, thank you to all of our, our speakers. It's been a very, very rich um, panel discussion. Um, we almost ended where we should have started with what happens when we don't do this? What happens when we don't finance the food system is the reality that an organization like the World Food Program has to either cut the people who get aid or has to give people less than their minimum daily requirements. And that, that what that does is it means we move from crisis to crisis because we know there are gonna be shocks. Shocks are now the new norm, especially with climate change. But the only way to prevent each shock leading to a crisis is to be prepared, is to have done those investments before. Pay the money up front is cheaper than after the event, right? That's what you said, Siddharth. Um, we, we've heard some optimism that this is possible. Every dollar of donor money has the potential to raise $4 of commercial finance. And we've seen examples of how that's happening but we've seen small examples. We haven't seen it at the big billions of level. We haven't seen it to the millions of farms and SMEs from production to distribution. So I think we've seen a lot of ideas. Um, to, to David and Peter, sorry, you, you, uh, you, you're online, but you gave us some very key examples of how you guys are trying to be more innovative. And we do have cases, but I think the real urgency now is to bring this to scale. Um, we will continue this discussion on innovative financing for food systems at the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development's annual General Assembly um, at the end of this week on Friday at IFAD. So if you're interested in continuing this discussion, um, there's a lot of Global Donor Platform colleagues sitting over there. Um, you can register and come if you want to keep engaging in this discussion on how we find more innovative ways to finance this massive investment gap. Thank you, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of CFS.